welcome everyone to the uh, second of the webinar series associated with AI for Decarbonization uh, Virtual Center for Excellence Advice, in short, which is aimed at the development of innovative AI technologies for decarbonization applications to support the transition to net zero. And ag Agritech is a, a part of this. Uh, this is a collaboration between Digital Cat Catapult, Energy Systems Catapult, and the Alan Turing Institute. And it's a part of uh, DESNES, which is the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero Innovation Portfolio. Uh, we will be delivering a series of webinars associated with key challenges that uh, on decarbonization, which highlights areas that could benefit from uh, AI adoption on, in the effort to uh, decarbonize. Uh, in this particular webinar, we will focus on controlled environment agriculture, and I'm very pleased to welcome experts uh, uh, in this um, area. Uh, particularly, uh, we will start with Eri Hayashi, who is the president of the Japan Plant Factory Association. For those of you who don't know, Japan has a long history of um, uh, working with uh, controlled environment, agriculture, vertical farming. And um, so very pleased that she's able to bring in her expertise in this area. Then we have Derek Stewart, who is the director of the Advanced Plant Growth Center at the James Hutton Institute. Um, and uh, then we have Adam Waterman, who is the chief software architect at Letters Grow, one of the prominent uh, vertical farming um, uh, uh, companies in the UK. So very pleased to welcome Ari. Um, each of the uh, speakers will uh, talk to us about their work for about 15 minutes, after which we will take questions. And um, uh, please use the Q&A uh, instead of the chat. That's what I've been told by the event manager, although I don't know how that works. Uh, but uh, very pleased to welcome you, Ari, and happy to have you start. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me and see my slides? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ruchi, for your very kind introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Eri Hayashi with Japan Plant Factory Association. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to discuss with you for the bright future. <laughs> and first of all, let me introduce a little bit about the our organization. So JPFA, Japan Plant Factory Association, was founded in 2010 with a mission to collaborate and introduce a sustainable plant production system with, with a collaboration with academia and industry. So with a, with a mission to contribute to solving global issues such as food, energy, resource, and also improving the um, People, quality of people's life. And we are supported by more than 200 companies. Uh, I think that 20% are international companies. And we are based on the, one of the campus of Chiba University in Kashiwanoha uh, campus. Kashiwanoha is one of the smart city um, in Chiba prefecture, which is greater Tok in greater Tokyo area. So main, our main activities include research and development with a collaboration with uh, Chiba University and other research institutes, and also some activities, workshops, or standardizations, or business technical support, anything to develop and also introduce uh, plant factory or control environment agriculture technology. Um, so this is the map. It's a show. It's like a showcase of housing. So each uh, first, there's around 20 greenhouses and then a plant factory in the vertical farm system with a different uh, company group working on anything has to be sustainable, working on automations or indoor breeding or phenotyping or um, other um, different um, research. So um, just to give a background, uh, since in Japan, we have a different climate so that the, the we have a hot and humid weather in the summer. So it's like how to cool 
the greenhouse is really crucial in a sustainable way. And then also this is one of the technology in the working on campus that the misting, very fine misting technology to control the environment. And also you can apply for the root zone to grow plants. And also there's some uh, seed propagated strawberry research going on and also uh, indoor breeding uh, projects, specifically tip burn resistance seed is already available. And also in the city, there are different sizes for different purpose. So as for the topic for today, as uh, so one of the important thing is that what is not yet done is that each facility is not yet connected to each other. Of course, it's not the AI is not used to control um, and it, it, to find the ultimate set point. So that's the next step for the future. So um, I'm very happy to talk specifically about the plant factory with artificial light in PFAL, indoor vertical farm. So one of the biggest feature of the plant factory is that since the cultivation room is airtight and highly insulated, so with that, it really makes us sim to simplify how much input and output, even the waste, that so we can visualize easily on an estimate online, even time series analysis. So meaning that the more we produce the plants, the meaning that we are generating data. So uh, with that, uh, with Plant Factory, it obviously makes us easy to achieve the high productivity, uniformity, reproducibility, or high observability, high controllability, which is really good, um, aligned good well with the AI technology. But the reality is that there's still so much space to be improved, especially when it comes to the commercial plant production, like for the uniformity or so the scalable hardware, the system is also important to develop. So uh, with this uh, background that's uh, with Plant Factory, uh, so it makes us easy to simply and simple and accurate data acquisition and time series analysis and also plant growth and the phenotype prediction, including the resource use efficiency or productivity with a unit of time in Plant Factory. So, um, so this is one of the examples. So without using the difficult or complicated model or AI models that it relatively easier to calculate because since it's closed environment to visualize the net photosynthesis or like a rate variable water uptake rate. But this is just a one step. So our ultimate goal is that to understanding the resource efficiency or rate variable, the speed of the speed plant activities. But our goal is that understanding what's going on with plant and also considering the business uh, factors, including like, you know, electricity rate or your goal of the business model. So considering that we need to, uh, based on the plant phenotype based environment control, taking into account the business related factor is very important for the future. So AI will play the crucial role to figure out this. And especially for the virtual PFAL simulator is very important as well, which the, it is very count on AI technology. Also like on the hardware or the initial uh, CAPEX is also um, is still high and also speaking of decarbonization so roughly speaking for the co2 emissions the construction account for the half for that so you know using the ai technology to understand the good materials and what the design of the system is really important for the future as well so this is one of the example of the existing uh, profitable plant factory uh, it was in Shizuoka prefecture in Japan called Eitoe factory using the solar panel like this and it's very clean inside uh, taking very careful uh, hygiene management but this company re really collecting all kinds of data even the workability or the hands movement of the every worker so they can calculate the resources efficiency or hygiene process management with a sensing and monitoring um, system um, so so this company is one of the good example collecting, accumulating in the past 10 years, uh, factory operations, accumulating so much different data for the environment management and the plant phenotype. So the next step is that, how do we analyze using the AI technology? Because the, the what makes us difficult is that we, since we have multi-objective, different uh, objective so that what is the best solution having a different purpose? So that's the way that we need the help of AI.
you know, this is a rough number for the resource use efficiency or productivity. So speaking of electric energy uh, productivity, roughly speaking, kilowatt well, kilowatt hour per um, is that uh, for the fresh produce, for the sellable produce after trimming the packaging, is roughly speaking 140 grams. Uh, that's a commercial number. So we uh, we believe that AI could help us to improve this uh, productivity you know, for the electric energy uh, the productivity as well. And I, I we believe that this figure is kind of in, important things for the for the to see the reality. So if the your cultivation room is highly airtight and then thermally isolated, and then also your perf coefficient of performance or air conditioner if it's back is um, four, for example. So this is the rough ratio for the electricity consumption. So uh, LED lights for 70% and H air conditioner 20% and the rest to 10%. So, um, but then we, ju not just uh, improving the efficacy of LED light system picture, but also we, the AI could help us to figure out what's the best way and what's how we can improve how we deliver the light depending on the plant situation and our goal. So they also the plant factory, um, as we are all aware of, we are dealing with plants. So that plant expression is really uh, uh, in, affected by the environment and the management, but also there's so much interaction between environment and the management. And so that, and um, also you have a different density or you have a different reflectance of cultivation space of human machine innovation. So, so much combination. So that's the way that we should AI again will help us uh, understand the, what's uh, for the ultimate uh, environmental control. But also I would like to highlight the fact that we are, even though we are speaking, using the term environment, but there are so many different environment the definition. So even there's an environment a set point, even the cultivation room environment, are you talking about air, light, root zone, and also the plant canopy, one single plant or the plant, plant community, and even above environment and also within environment. And then also for the phenotype, there are single leaf, individual plants or plant community, shoot roots. So different uh, factors. So I I believe that it's more important even for the research paper as an experiment. Uh, it's really important for the next generation that to, we have the same standard definition taking to even account the single plants as well, not just the plant community. So that AI could help us to translate or understand for the different uh, research activities to, uh, to for the I think that if we use the same terminology and uh, definitions. And for the plant phenotype, there's so many things to understand, but even with a relatively simple canopy structure, there's area, angle, shape. And if the, since we are dealing with plants and then plants, there's so much overlapping leaves. So that, so from my understanding, AI right now is helping us that is a moment to using AI technology to for the uh, machine learning for the, you know, the vision analysis and to understand the area of, of the leaf area. But so, but then for the next step is that uh, after that, we need to use AI, not just to understand the plant phenotype, but also how we could understand the interaction between plant and environment or even the management and hopefully in the future the uh, genotype. So that with a uh, plant factory that the beauty is that we could share the data and then uh, we could from the different expertise that we could analyze using the same data but also the good thing is that we can do the same an analysis or experiment again and again. So analyzing individual plants and each canopy at the same time. So that's the next the generation is that with the AI that we could just decide the objective, but then we could consider in the market or business factors, uh, AI could help us uh, determine the optimal set of the environmental factors to maximize the given objective function. Um, so um, I personally believe that plant factory and uh, we could grow plants, but also we, the, at the same time, it's a good tool for the research so that everyone could be the researcher, even if you are a farmer. So 
you know, if distributed farming system, if, if the single um, system is connected to each other, and then with the help of AI, we could um, um, we could use and understand the plant expression as for the different purpose, even understand the plant communication for the, you know, for the plant and our entertainment and other purpose, or even using the you know, ecosystem, the social economy or sustainability using the clean energy. So there are so many things. So I think I, I'm running out of time. So I leave uh, for the, the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Eri. And uh, we will take questions at the end after all the three panelists have spoken. So now I welcome Derek uh, from James Hutton Institute to give his talk. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm kind of going to take a more contextualized approach to this. Um, having been significantly older than any of the panel, uh, been in the game a lot longer, so kind of maybe taking a long-term view. Um, so I'm director of the Advanced Plant Growth Centre, which is a £30 million innovation centre, regional development innovation centre. So we're not an ivory tower. We're very much about um, discovery, innovation, and translation into economy and impact. Um, and as part of this, controlled environment ag has become a key, a key area we're working on a lot now, um, and all aspects of it. I like to think about what context you're sitting in. So we are living through a period of significant climate change with, and this is the UK temperatures. The average UK temperature is creating a record every year. Um, our peak temperature is peaking almost on an annual basis now. Um, so you try growing something outside under those conditions. Also, if you look to certainly for the UK and Europe, where we import from, um, large part of the areas in Europe that the UK and North Europe uh, imports fresh produce from um, was basically on fire last summer, and this summer is going to look the same. So produce either being seeded to be grown or actually growing is diminishing, and water shortages uh, and so on are causing real problems. So countries are going to have to start onshoring production through different means, and controlled environment ag and vertical farming is a key route to do that. Um, and actually the long-term predictions for things like the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change are identifying that by 2050, potentially up to 40% of the lands, the Earth's land surface will have different climates. So what we grow now will not be the same going forward. And actually where we grow it will, will be very different as well. So we need to think about how controlled environment ag works with existing field agriculture. And actually some of the learnings from field ag are coming in to control the environment ag. So if you're growing uh, field crops, which we probably won't, it's not economic to grow in controlled environment ag, let's be honest. So if you go in a combine harvester, if you go inside them now, it's like being on the Starship Enterprise. So it's, it's huge data enabled systems uh, with multiple screens and it's recording multiple things. And it's looking up GPS based systems. It's telling you what's the quality and moisture of the crop coming on and going through into the hopper in the bar. And we've done lots of work in that area, whether it's using earth observation and satellite-based systems. Again, data-enabled systems looking at crops. They give you maps akin to the ones on the far right, the top right there, which could tell you about flooding, droughting, disease, nutrient deficiencies, soil problems. But they're, they're informing decision systems. And actually, we're seeing in the field AI systems coming into that now. And they're commercial, almost well, machine learned, not AI. Um, but you were also, we're developing systems also, as well as those looking at ones to look at soil mapping and developing these systems into dashboards. I'm not expecting the next generation of food producers to have to come out with a degree in computing to be able to understand the data systems. So we need this bit in the middle, the middleware to create and spit out data that will allow uh, a grower or a farmer to be informed. Now that's indoor or outdoor. And we've kind of got, we're developing these systems there. We have to be aware that the farming system has changed. Um, and as we evolve, um, and this kind of gets us into the low carbon piece, that some of the, the new crop on farm can also be energy. So this can be harvested in terms of wind turbines, solar, anaerobic digestion, deep borehole geothermal, and what that allows the grower and farmer to do is diversify his business. 
And what we're seeing working with farmers is actually tradition, what you would call traditional farmers, they immediately get controlled environment ag and vertical farming. So when we have two different vertical farms on site, and when we've got farmers in, they'll look at these and go, so this will produce a crop 24-7, 365. You go, yeah. So the next questions are, how much is it and when can I get it? These are, these are astute businessmen. They're not worried about how these things run. They know they, they can get systems to run these. But you've then got problems, and I think Eri alluded to that in terms of the skills that you need to run these are different from what you need to run a traditional farm. So you need you need to be able to spin multiple plates in terms of data. And actually, the middleware systems that could be machine learning and AI will help measurably that way to brigade that data and offer up uh, informed choices of what needs to be changed. So if we talk about vertical farming, there are as many vertical farms constructed as, as you can imagine. They can be lo-fi where you could go to your hardware store and buy some UVPC pipes and construct them to the state-of-the-art systems like um, intelligent growth solutions at the bottom, square roots, bottom right, or vertical future, which is the middle left, as you're seeing. So there's a whole range of these. And I kind of get back, back to that problem where they've got different environments. They've got different recording systems. We need to start thinking about, for AI to work effectively, interoperability to different systems, potentially. And what are the standards that are getting reported to as well? I think that, that work is kind of starting to formulate now as well. So let's look into, I'm not going to present much data here. I thought it was more about concepts. And, and Eri's presented lots of really interesting stuff on this. And I'm kind of maybe going to expand on a couple of bits. We've done some experiments, we've done lots of experiments, let's be honest, on the impact of something like light on yield. So a simple factor of the light you shine on the crop gives a huge impact on yield. Now, that may seem obvious, but hard data to that on different types of light on exactly the same crop gives you wildly varied impacts on yield. So not many people are actually reporting that in a coherent manner together. So you can then standardize and move forward as an industry. Similarly, and this is an interesting one, we did work with Intelligent Growth Solutions and a company called Garden who were developing uh, an automated chlorophyll fluorescence sensor. So this is just Basel and it's different batch trials and each S is a different lighting regime. And what we've measured are different component chemicals down the side. So you can see the different light uh, recipes are impacting massively on nutritive value and quality. Now, you, you cannot measure all this in real time at a compound level. So you've got to brigade and step a tier up and get the sensors to identify what, what you're changing and how that's impacting on quality. Now, that might be because you want to direct to a different quality or actually you just want to direct your system back into normal. So there could be a problem that maybe you're... That's, what we found is this, this has been identifying small problems in the nutrient system that it can then correct back onto or identify system problems, or there's something wrong with the biology of the plant. It could be your rich fax gone slightly off and it's identifying changes here. So again, it's using um, developing AI systems based on sensors has been massively useful and it gives indicators on how you can start to direct what you grow and how you grow it. Eri kind of touched on this bit as well, and I thought I'd put some numbers on it. So if you look at, say you're growing one variety of crop, right? So genetics is not a problem here. We're only going to grow one. Basically, you give the plant light, nutrition, temperature. You'll vary the gas and humidity. Um, and if we talk about the subsections of that and just pick three, three settings, if you multiply all them together, they'll give about 6,500 unique combinations, all of which will create a unique plant. Now that plant will have different, it'll look different. Some of them will look very similar, but they'll be slightly different, but it'll have different nutritive values, flavors, aromas, appearances, and yields. Now, if you were growing that traditionally, that's a nightmare. AI will really inform that direction going forward. Or actually, once, you, once that's fixed, if you want to have a bespoke type of plant on the right, can AI inform what you need to go what you need to do going back away will it inform the conditions you need. So say you wanted to create a plant that had X, Y, and Z flavor. If you'd done enough work looking at the conditions to drive it that way, 
you could plug in the flavors and go back the way and design, get the process to work to create that. It's kind of like reverse genetics almost. So we can see how AI is working on this, but sustainability, how do we relate it to low carbon? Well, I, I would argue that actually energy is the killer in controlled environment. Uh, overall, all the, all the publications have done that. We published on this as well. So we did an interesting study where we, we needed to, to com cross, compare and contrast open field and vertical farming. So we did, we just looked, picked, we picked a few crops and this is just data on lettuce. So what you've got here is um, glass house in the winter, glass house in the summer in the UK, UK open field, Spanish open field, and then vertical farming under an average EU energy mix, which is predominantly not renewable. But in Scotland, we've, we're increasingly becoming renewable and we're almost 100% renewable. And comparing the, the emissions profile or the emission, total emissions or CO2 equivalents of the produce. So you can see as we progress to a renewable energy, so Scotland's predominantly hydro with wind coming in significantly, we're down to basically um, a glass house in the summer. Um, or actually a Spanish, but arguably better than a Spanish open field because that's including transport, of course, to get that here. So we've got the capacity for sustainability anyway on a, a low carbon food production system to onshore production. And actually, if the person who's producing that has access to that energy themselves, is producing it themselves, their energy cost disappears or becomes very small. So they can create a significant margin for their crop. And we have to bear in mind, these are economic. These are just ni not niceties. They have to be paid for. So going forward, what we'll probably see for vertical farms in the future, and uh, here we've got the, so the big white box is your vertical farm. The bit next to it could be glass houses, it could be germination systems, it could be a vertical farm producing plantlets to go into a glass house or outside, and kind of working with a blended energy system, whether it's um, hydro, wind, pyrolysis, anaerobic digestion, um, and solar. Depending on where you are, it'll be different. And that brings back the idea of, of well, if you're going to do it in Scotland, it's going to be wind and hydro. If you do it in different places where it used to be traditional um, coal mining areas, you might actually put cold water down the coal mine and bring up warm water and harvest that energy that way. Or if you go to North Africa or aspects of Japan, I would imagine area, you can get solar as well. Um, so depending on where you go, you'll have to blend it. But then we need to start thinking then about energy storage because the wind always doesn't blow. Sometimes it's not sunny. If you've got deep geothermal, that kind of is always going to be there all the time. Because if it isn't, we've got other problems to worry about. The centre of the earth is cooled down and we're all going to die. But that's a long way off here. But I think I kind of wanted to, so we can see where decarbonisation can fit in the system. We've described where AI fits in. But I think what we probably need to discuss, and this is maybe teeing up Adam from industry coming better, there's lots of industries that are looking at controlled environment, particularly as climate change is coming in, is very important. And an interesting one there is, I would draw your attention to is actually next generation industries like insurance and risk. Um, depending on where you are in the world at the moment, and particularly in Europe, the price of olive oil has gone through the roof because of climate change. Cocoa for chocolate has gone through the roof because of climate change. We're seeing climate changes impacting on every aspect of our food, su food supply chain now, which means risk and insurance costs are going up. So the, the, these industries are really interested in supporting industries that will not be impacted by climate change and will continue to produce. Now, they may not produce cocoa or olive oil inside, although we can get dwarf plants. That may be a way forward. But what they'll produce is the plantlets that are adapted to climate change through speed breeding in vertical farming that can then be grown outside. So again, we can start to figure out what are the impacts on how you use these systems, you use them for growth research, uh, or for supporting field ag, and that, that reduces the sustainability footprint of how you would use these things. So I'll, I'll kind of draw a line there because I've thrown a lot of kind of concepts at you and hopefully generated some questions for you. So look forward to questions at the end. Thank you, Derek. Um, uh, that was great and a perfect lead in to Adam's uh, uh, talk, which is coming more from the perspective of uh, uh, running a business and uh, working on the ground. So uh, uh, over to you, Adam. Yep. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Derek, and uh, thank you, um, thank you, Richie. Um, can you guys hear me? All right. This is working. Yep. Lovely. So yeah. Um, my name's Adam. I think what's interesting is actually when I think I signed up for this talk, I was the chief software architect at Let Us Grow, which is a vertical, which is a kind of irrigation and vertical farm uh, production company. Or it, yeah. Um, but I'm the software team that I was running is now actually spinning out into their own company unit, which is hoping called Astara. So I'm now the founder and technical director of Astara, which is a, so it was spawned within Let Us Grow and it's basically a software platform solution for like control management and data of controlled environment agriculture. Um, this has also led to currently very stressed and this is why I haven't prepared any slides because my it's all a bit mad over here. But I think one of the interesting things that we've talked about here is so, yeah, so everyone's mentioned like the open field agriculture, which is, and the, there's very interesting things going on with AI and that things, particularly like satellite imagery as Derek and uh, Eri both mentioned, there's some really good stuff going on. Um, and then they've mentioned the other side, the other far extreme, which is kind of vert like vertical farming in these kind of like very controlled industrial factory kind of settings. Um, but where we've actually gone with our software is kind of like, this is kind of very big gap that's kind of in the middle, that's kind of half and half. So, I describe CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture, as basically anything you can no longer drive a tractor over. So there's over, I think there's over half a million hectares globally of polytunnels, which are semi-controlled. There's like semi-controlled agriculture. And then there's also thousands, probably I think close to hundreds of thousands of hectares of um, greenhouses as well uh, globally. And once you, so we've basically taken the learnings from this kind of, control management data platform that we've developed for the Let Us Grow and their vertical farms and are now applying it to greenhouses and polytunnels to get a much larger impact. Um, and one of the main issues, so I mean, I think if you're trying to get like, if you're trying to have as big an impact as possible, these are definitely kind of markets I would consider looking at and looking into because there's kind of like, we can kind of consider it a scale of um, control capabilities. So, I mean, your most basic systems would be a polytunnel that then has um, maybe irrigation in it. That's pretty standard. So you've got irrigation and you've got nutrients and other things like that. But then pretty rapidly, they tear up from that to even polytunnels now have like roll up and roll down vents so they can be automatically vented with motors. You can then have fans in there and then they start blurring the line into automated greenhouses where you start having um, additional lighting top-ups. Maybe you can, it's more, maybe it's more advanced again, you can have multi-spectrum lighting. You can then maybe also even in polytunnels, you get some of them even come with like heating pipes where there's a customer with a biomass boiler um, and there's not a biomass, a biomass burner and also um, uh, the food weight, um, like a biogas generator as well that they use for heating their tunnels and greenhouses. So you end up with this kind of, blurry spectrum on control capabilities and also you're kind of wrestling you're still exposed to some of the environments you end up with a pretty interesting kind of control like in my opinion a very difficult and complicated control and optimization out like problem where you've got partial control and partial environmental impacts you're trying to do your best to optimize the control side of things with whatever capabilities you have whilst also trying to do a whole projection and prediction kind of thing around what your kind of environmental impacts are gonna be on your crops and your growing. And all of this then varies massively based on kind of time of year, geolocation, the randomness of the weather. And you end up with this kind of very kind of, like just incredibly complicated control problem that varies a huge, like, I think this is one of the other things that's really facing an issue that's facing the industry is like, as um, Eri mentioned, it's like, it's difficult to come up with standards when you have almost a like plant factory, you've got one of these very like good, perfect controlled factories and you realize just how complicated it is. Well, when I've got, you know, we've got one customer in Kent that's got a bunch of different sites um, and the, you know, the climate environment varies from one site to another, just 20, you know, five miles down the road from each other because one's on a hillside facing south, one's on a hillside facing north, one's on a flat lower area. And just, you end up with like, basically what we've had to realize is that we've been, whilst implementing like the control, so we have 
control over things like vents, valves, pumps, motors, and we have sensor inputs. You kind of need to have, we're slowly working out a way to build like almost like digital twins on a site by site basis. And it seems like this kind of like very small scale digital twinning is going to be required that you can then run site by site optimization on. And it's required this kind of very distributed, um, like highly, well, what would be the way like, hopefully not too bespoke because you can't make highly bespoke things per customer, but you need to make something that's kind of individually customized to each kind of farm or each location within a farm. And it's given rise to this kind of very difficult and interesting control problem as just the sheer variety. Like, and then you have to do all of this whilst, as Derek mentioned earlier, you have to do all of this whilst making it a system that's relatively easy for a farmer to use. Like, like he said, the, um, yeah, some tractors look like Starship Enterprise these days, and you're trying to do the same thing where they, you have to make a system that's adaptable enough and capable enough to allow them to control their farms, see insights, and get predictions out, and is flexible enough to match anything that's required or any of the variations you see in like farm designs and all of these things from site to site. So that's the kind of one of the fundamental problems, I think, that we're facing. Another big issue that I think exists is... I think there's a real gulf in, like, it's relatively, you know, a lot of the event, advanced farms that people have talked about, these kind of advanced vertical farms, they're obviously designed with kind of modern tech in mind. Everything is already connected to the internet. You've got all your data sources rigged up. This is kind of, and again, in advanced greenhouses and other systems and stuff like that, you'll see a relative level of connection and things. But for the majority of these polytunnels and glasshouse systems, there's this kind of huge gulf of what I would describe as just basic infrastructure where I've seen, I've seen coffee machines, like these kind of go to, I don't know if you're ever at some event hosting places that are like nice networking and stuff. These like touch panel coffee machines. There are coffee machines that are significantly more advanced than the irrigation systems running like a hectare of polytunnels. These things have like a screen that looks like something from your old 2000s calculator with four buttons strapped on the bottom of it. And it's got no internet connection whatsoever. So, this is kind of golf of trying to link up and connect like the basic infrastructure of these like polytunnels and glass houses to something that will actually allow people like Ari or Derek to come in and enable AI to actually like really improve and like pull data out. But also the more difficult bit is one thing to pull data out of these systems, but it's a whole other side of it to be able to put data back in to like, inf like for it to take and inform control decisions and control mechanics in these systems. So that's, definitely something that I feel is like a huge area that the industry is slowly catching up to as they try to modernize their infrastructure and actually get it connected to the internet. And that's the other thing, internet connections are not stable anywhere. I'm sure they, we think we are in our nice houses and homes, but I'm sure if you go to a polytunnel, even in Kent, let alone Almeria or in any other part of the world, the internet connections are non-existent to barely stable at best, I would describe it. Um, so that's a whole other fact of like we've had to run most of our we're looking at literally running like not obviously training but like at, once we have compiled and optimized models for a site we have to literally run them on site on the edge which gives us a whole that's another like whole like infrastructure and computing problem of just like architectural design problems um in terms of other things that i think are kind of, i'm just kind of taking a big overview rather than i'm afraid of like issues I see in the industry. I think I think one of the most interesting problems is that the other two have already really alluded to as well, Derek and Eric, is definitely just environmental control. I think such as just air temperature, humidity, and uh, VPD is a common one. So you often have like these three targets, which are all semi-related to each other and interdependent, and you'll have bounds on each. And if you, of course, you can increase and decrease temperature, but that affects your relative humidity and your VPD. And likewise, you can increase and decrease your you like the humidity of the air, but that also affects your VPD and potentially your temperature. And because these three, these are like, I think there's some, I think we recently swapped globally to now we spend more electricity and power cooling our cells than we do heating. So we've swapped from instead of like gas and power being used for heating or fires and things like that, we've now swapped to more of it's being used to cool the like buildings via HVACs and stuff like that than we do actually heating them. And HVACs are incredibly, they cost a lot of energy to run and they, especially if you're trying to do something like dehumidification 
a lot of these farms run quite humid and you want to reduce humidity. And I think there's just with the HVAC systems I've seen and worked with, their control capabilities and effects leave an awful lot to be desired. Um, I certainly wish that they were better. I'm sure you can do high-end ones that are okay, but what I've seen with the generic types, they leave a lot to be desired. So I think there's basically a huge amount of optimization that could be done around the kind of HVAC and environmental control area just because it's such a large cost on certain of these things. And then that also still follows over to the polytunnels and greenhouses because now you have kind of mixed, you know, mixed controls where you have heating, you also have fans, you also have, you know, humidifiers, you also have vents that you can open and close. You also have your external weather. And then likewise, I'm sure as Ari's done already in her um, like vertical farming unit, I expect they'll already be using external air to try and reduce the, because it's very much, you know, you can use external air to either reduce your temperature or increase it or reduce your humidity or potentially increase your humidity inside. And that's a lot more cost energy efficient and cost efficient than trying to run an AC or expensive HVAC unit or heaters and stuff like that. So this is kind of like, again, it's all about this kind of continuous grayscale in tech that kind of exists in all of these areas as to the kind of complexity and like capabilities around the methods of controlling these different like targets and attributes. Um, and yeah, I think basically if you talk to us, uh, this is the other thing I think that I think it's a really interesting area for AI and data scientists to get into, because if you, I find it quite odd sometimes when I talk to some data science students where they're trying to look for a problem or something interesting they could solve. And I assure you, if you talk to any farmer and ask them if they have problems, they will give you a very long list and talk your ear off for about three hours. Um, so the amount of problems, and given how huge the agriculture industry is, the amount of problems out there and potential that can be solved, or you could even just try and like help an effect is absolutely huge. So I would certainly advise that just, yeah, there's a huge amount that can be done here in this field, pun intended, there you go. But um, yeah, I hope that's okay. It was a rather yeah. blitz talk, but I think I'll leave it there, short and sharp. Thanks, Adam. Uh... So I'm going to kick off with, uh, I see that there are questions coming in already, but I'm going to kick off with uh, the burning question that I've had ever since we put together this seminar, which is that uh, you mentioned that about bespoke digital twins for you know, different polytunnels or different farms. And uh, you know, we were there when we were talking about building controls, I work on buildings. So, you know, in the sense that you know, before it became standardized and we said that, okay, what we learn from one building can be applied to another building. So how much of standardization and data sharing exists within the community of vertical farms? Because my experience has been that there's a lot of proprietal knowledge and protection around the proprietal knowledge that's going on that's actually not serving the industry very well. So I'd like to hear all three perspectives and also, uh, uh, you know, different contexts, uh, starting with you, Adam. Um, yes, I think, I think it varies. Some companies are obviously very protective over the data, but I've also seen some interesting partnerships come up between, there have been some AI companies that are partnering with some of these control um, companies that already exist. You, some of the big control, like names in European agricultural control are people like Priva, Hogan Dawn, and Ritter. And I've seen some partnerships already coming between AI companies that are partnering these companies that are capable of doing the control and then able to take customer data and hopefully input some control back and use some optimization around those. So the partnerships do seem to be existing. I don't know if it's it's not on a kind of open and public method. It's like these companies have clearly agreed a partnership and then decided to move forwards, which, but I mean that there's nothing wrong with that. It works. I think, um, yeah, I'm not sure in terms of yeah. openness of other data. I'll pass it over to someone else. Um, Derek, do you? Yeah, I think um, like any industry, they tend to be frightened to give data away. Um, and the fear is what, I think actually farming is like this as well. They won't give the data away, but don't necessarily use the data either. 
Um, so we've kind of taken different approaches, particularly in things like sustainability. The, the, the approach we're doing on that, we're working with many companies now, is to go, we're looking to create a baseline on what's the sustainability of production. So we kind of need your data to calculate that. So what we will do is we won't share your data with anyone. We'll sign a contract to do that. And we will give, what we want to do is build an industry-based range, but we will tell you where you sit within that range. Mm -hmm. And so the data, we're getting their data, but they're getting something back for it. So that kind of builds up bond the trust. And I think the more you get people in, the better feel you'll get for at least the baseline on sustainability. Now, you can then take that approach for many other things. Um, and I think the industry has to start to learn to work. As to be, if you want to be brutally honest from an economic side, you need to grow the pie, not just grow your slice of the pie. Now, to grow the full pie of controlled environment, you have to work together. Competition will kill that stone dead and field lag will just stand, sit back and watch and watch them die off. Um, if you do work together, it's more sensible. You'll start to then develop interoperability in systems. Um, you'll develop standards that have to be applied because if you take charge of your own system and create standards of safety, so for example, vertical farming or controlled environment ag with no soil, would, do we want to develop a new standard for an organic equivalent? Because if you're not using pesticides or so on, you can be um, organic-like. I say, do you need that standard? be developed. That's another point. Um, or do you just develop a rigorous pesticide free? Again, there's lots of different options within that. But actually, how you report that data to get to that point, it should be easy to, to agree. Um, we've got it in different scientific di disciplines, like the Miami Convention, when you're reporting on something, minimum amount of information to replicate these type of experiments. That can be applied industrially. And actually, industries possibly may have to start reporting some of that data back to report on their emissions anyway. Mm -hmm. If we've got the standards there, they may actually be starting to record this data. So let's record it in a uniform way so we can cross compare. If, and it goes back to the old maxim, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Yeah. That, that works across everything. And a lot of places are not really measuring it at the moment. But it's a kind of new industry, so I, I, I cut them a break on that. Mm -hmm. Eri. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, I think the data does, I think the more important is like understanding what the data means. So the, just, just by having the data doesn't mean a lot, but then understanding and calculating and then to give some meaning is, I think that create more business opportunity. But I mean, from this is this industry is too small and it too you know it's just a beginning to be called industry yet. So from the Japanese case, though, it took some time. But this we try to open up the work with a company to sit together and then make some definition for the productivity standard. So I think that Japanese company kind of getting more open each other and they're talking to each other and they're helping each other for the supply, some produce when they have more customers. So I think that's a good start point. So I think we could learn from the case, the good case from the Netherlands greenhouse industry as well. But um, yeah, but I think I personally think that, you know, for developing the industry, of course, the company play a crucial role for sure, but also at the same time to to from the perspective of the social well beings, I think that we because company tend to hold and then close the you know the outcome and some research outcomes, so that I think that you, maybe the UK government or even the worldwide they give some more budget to the university or research institute so that we can have more dy dynamic research project together with a company so that we could share the baseline of the the best I mean the technology to accelerate the development of the industry to be known as a true industry I think yes and um, I think one of the questions that have cropped up I think is asking if I can interpret it correctly it's in the olive oil context but it's basically asking to compare the uh, regular agri uh, tech 
uh, a realm with the vertical farming approach and uh, if there are similarities and if you would have any uh, 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 points to raise about what we can borrow from one to the other. And I think Adam, you're already mentioning that, you know, you started with the controlled environment agriculture and now you're applying it to less controlled environment, including polytunnels and greenhouses. And to me, that's personally very fascinating because it's okay if you have a very precisely controlled environment, but usually they come with very bespoke systems. But what I found find very interesting is when you can repurpose spaces for uh, agriculture. And those, of course, uh, uh, pose challenges but coming back to the question that is posed from the audience, what do you see as similarity and differences in the approaches taken in regular agriculture versus vertical farming? Um, am I starting this one? Um, sure. Just that by, it depends what you mean by regular agriculture. It, do you mean open field or? Yeah. yeah. The, um, I think, I think there's a huge amount of crossover that can be done with just like working out like in terms of like crop like crop reactions to environments so i mean obviously you know the you can do an awful lot of research into like maybe like breeding better crops or knowing how or where you could you know because if you have the ability to simulate any kind of environment a vertical farm you can you know you can do you can have vertical farms that grow for you know profit obviously but you can also have research farms as i'm sure I was like, what well, Aries doing? Um, which a lot of the research that comes out of them can still be incredibly useful for um, like, you know, classic agriculture, field-based agriculture, because it will still tell you a lot about how that crop is going to behave, what kind of yields of things, what environments it will do well in, how you can increase or decrease its resistance to certain things and kind of anything along those lines. So I certainly see huge amounts of crossover in the two. And also a lot of, so a lot of the optimization around, I think, open field agriculture is done because you don't have it's kind of a hit and hope in control of your environment but therefore a lot of what they'll be looking at is trying to estimate their yields going forwards and try and optimize like when they should plant what they should plant where they should plant it and then trying to estimate and project what kind of yields they're going to get out at the end so i mean there's an interesting case where i think what's it there was some i think it was tulips it was some flower grown in the uk and normally Basically, spring, like as you go to the UK, the like spring move. I think we lost Adam. Uh, Derek, do you want to come in? While yeah, so I mean, the interplay of innovations in one moving into the other, I would see that there, I think that this is key, and I think, um, I don't know if Harry would agree. I don't see controlled environment ag and vertical farming as a binary system to field ag. It's part of a portfolio of production. And I think we, we have to think that way. And actually, if you speak to a grower, they just see it's, it's, it's a no, no control environment and a progressively controlled environment. Um, and the no controlled environment is becoming really problematic. Um, and so they, they're thinking about what they want to do. But the tools, tech, and, and sensors, for example, systems developed in one can be immediately often transferable into the other. Um, so the, the chlorophyll fluorescence sensor I was talking about, or there's um, different near-infrared sensors, visible, hyperspectral imaging, they're all being really well developed in field and coming in to the controlled environment now. And I think the broader use for the transferable technologies reduces the price of the technology. And becomes more uniform and applicable. Um, the, particularly if you've got ones, if you've got earth observation systems that are, are looking at massive resolutions, well, you, you're not going to be looking at resolution at that scale inside controlled environment ag, or maybe you are, and it could be a sweeping sensor. Um, and so I, I see there's lots of commonality in there. Um, I think the, the one of the problems I kind of see in this is actually people see in agriculture as a viable target for a lot of these developments. Agriculture comes way at the end of people's chain. I think it still has a reputation of um, cow dung on the boots, dungarees and straw hanging out of the mouth. It's, it's not that, it's pretty high tech industry. 
and it needs to attract the people in there um, and people to see it as a respected one. I think um, Anna might be able to comment better on this, but the biggest upswing in younger people coming into agriculture has been from the computing side, developing systems on crop prediction um, and disease prediction, all of these systems going into dashboarded systems. Um, that's kind of created a prolifer proliferation of multiple different units. Whereas as a farmer, I don't want to pay for multiple subscriptions. I want that all in one. I want a unified system. And that kind of goes back to if you're managing a vertical farm. I don't want a system that's just going to control the heating. I want something that's going to do the heating, control the plants, tell me what the energy is, perhaps I put sustainability measurements that I have to report on. Um, so they're kind of doing similar things that they're just tweaked differently. I think the only unique bit that I think controlled environment ag and vertical farming has that the field one doesn't is the HVAC systems. Um, and that's very much, um, I'm not convinced they've evolved particularly much. I would agree with what Adam said. That there's some really interesting solid state energy transfer systems where you harvest heat energy, you can concentrate it down and convert it to electricity and that will power your LEDs. But they're, they're just emerging technologies. So companies like Botanic Energy, for example, but they're, that, that's then teasing apart humidity, temperature. And that mm -hmm. might be a way forward to start to play around with these things. So any way you can make them more circular, harvest waste, and reduce your costs and sustainability is going to win. But unfortunately, that comes back into investment. So if you're a young company, let us grow, I'm sure I've had this. What's your ESG? What's your sustainability profile? Because we won't invest in someone who doesn't have that. So you, it's interesting. It's an industry where they're going to have to measure sustainability right from the start now to get investment. So I think there's ma major crossover. Tools and tech is there. It's quite an exciting area, particularly for young scientists or entrepreneurs to come into the game. Okay. Yep. Ari, over to you. Oh, thanks. Um, I think as Derek says, I just totally agree um, that um, Particle Farm Plant Factory is one of the portfolio among other options that we have. And even we have so much uh, similarity with like aquacultures and other food, real um, Broadway in you know, a fruit production system. But I think uh, practically speaking, the speaking of olive oil, that we could use this technology, plant factory vertical farm technology for the seedling production as well. So I think that's the very practical way to use so that you can have more healthy and good seedling and so that you can transplant to the field. So I think it doesn't have to be like a total process, but uh, we could use it by each process uh, what it could apply well. And then also the plant factory in the vertical farm is a good tool to understand what is going on within plants. So that I think it's to, uh, so that you can use, apply for the field growing as well. So that's good tool for the research, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I can then, uh, because all of you referred to it, transition into the big question in the room that, uh, you know, the big cause here are carbon both in terms of monetary cost for the business, but also with respect to um, uh, climate. So uh, the, the way that I've seen most vertical farms address it is through solar panels or you know, some form of renewable energy. But I've also visited farms in uh, uh, Kent where they end up partnering with uh, power plants and end up using the waste, heat, and CO2. And Derek, you referred to using waste resources. And that's one of the key questions that in the if we want to push this to the future and we see vertical farming playing a prominent role, should we be, is it, do you think sustainable to look into waste resources rather than relying on uh, solar panels or wind turbines to power these systems? It depends on where you are, what waste resources you have. I mean, going back to that comment I made about um, the coal industry, so putting cold water down and bringing hot water up, I would see that as a waste resource. So you're using basically geothermal heating and in there. Um, now, interestingly, if you do that, you will put your growing systems in areas that are still kind of socially deprived or poorly developed as well. 
So if you're going back to the old mining communities, there's probably a lot of these areas are still lacking any big industries. So you're putting high tech-ish jobs into areas that are needing these jobs. So again, it's I, I would always I always go back to this analogy: the whole system's like an onion. You peel one layer away, and another set of problems yeah, arise. Yeah. Um, and again, I think I mentioned that it's the using the waste resources to make it sustainable. That might change the geography of where you produce food. Yeah. Um, so it won't necessarily be the heartland of England or Kent, for example, to produce these things. Actually, it won't be Kent because it's too hot in the summer. They're struggling. They're now pivoting away from a lot of these things and starting to grow grapes for wine. So there's a great example of how agriculture is changing there. So we might put these in places where they're more sensibly fit. You may, you could potentially even use for the energy piece um, wave energy, or if it's or if it's offshore wind, put your vertical farms next to major international distribution ports, so you can ship the stuff where you want to. Or even if you come internally, all the ports are all on road infrastructure systems. Um, so it's it's not necessarily it's almost you can have a great idea, but actually it won't fit where you are. It may be three hundred miles away. Um, so what what you term as a waste or the, or the key resources has to be thought about almost first, I would say, um, and that will then suggest what your build may be. Mm -hmm. I know certainly there's another one. I mean, the, the idea I've had, I'm trying to pursue it here, we have a major hospital here that's coming to the end of life. If you're building a new hospital, there is so much heat and CO2 from the yeah. boiler house so you can scrub the CO2, take the nasties out, put the CO2 into the vertical farm, controlled environment thing. You've got mm -hmm. lots of heat from the boiler. So you've reduced energy. And actually, you, you've got a theoretically low cost. Now, it depends on the economics. Mm -hmm. Is it a social enterprise? Put that food into the hospital because you've got a, a, a really captive audience, depending on the size. So vertical farming can impact on social and urban design as well. Yeah. So it's it's... There's no one shoe fits all on this one, I'm afraid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Ari, do you have uh, any insights into this? Yeah, sure. As Derek mentions, that I think it totally depends on the which region or area you are, but also as like a social, I mean, social design and urban planning method, even pre urban or um other rural area is also important. But maybe like we already have the existing technology like solar, geothermal, other uh, energy technology. But maybe I might be a little extreme, but in the future, we never know that we want to contribute to generating the energy as well. No matter everything that we do, we want to be contributed to creating the energy so that we could be autonomous, like every resource autonomous, like living or not even just farming. I think our living could be autonomous. So I think that's a, you know extremely ideal situation. Mm -hmm. I, I think maybe it might be extreme, but I think it, I hope it be like that in the future. <laughs> Adam. Right. Um, this, this was the crossover between, sorry, could you, uh, could you repeat the question? There was a... It's about the energy and, and decarbonization challenge associated. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, of course. The um, I think certainly. So in, I think certainly in ver like the vertical farming thing, it's very much like energy based. But I think another thing that's overlooked, certainly in the polytons glasshouse thing, is um, like water use. And water accounts for a large amount of the actual energy consumption of any given kind of you know water scarcity and like. Certainly in terms of climate impact, water scarcity is a real issue. And then also the amount of energy that goes into just cleaning water, treating water and pumping water around is actually very significant. So I think there's an awful lot to be said for um, particularly in greenhouse and polytunnels for actually increasing just water efficiency use. And that's another area that is certainly worth looking into in those markets. Because obviously, if you don't have a lighting or HVAC system, then your energy costs on that respect are significantly lower. But I mean, if you want an example, there was a polytunnel site that I think was about 10, no, only a, only a couple of hectares actually, relatively, it wasn't huge. Um, and by, so they irrigate their systems and then, you know, some of the, hopefully most of the water goes into plants or as much as you can, but some of it runs off and it's basically over irrigated. 
Um, they saved, I believe, like 35,000 pounds a year in fertilizer alone by redu like by better fine tuning their like irrigation cycles. So they were wasting less water on runoff while still getting the plant requirements. And that's just like your, those will be like, you know, carbon and pet like petro based fertilizer things. So that already, if you're 30,000 pounds is like, that's tons of fertilizer a year, which is a direct kind of comparison to CO2 and decarbonization there. Plus all of the amount of water they were actually pulling up to then even use like, if it's, if, that, if it's that much fertilizer, you know, your percentage of fertilizer and water is tiny. So the amount of water you've actually saved is orders of magnitude higher. So there's really big kind of potential savings, especially with, you know, the way the world's going at the moment with the kind of threat of like water yeah. issues and um, water scarcity. So I think that, I think that carbon use and, you know, decarbonization and more efficient water use do actually go hand in hand. And it's an area that should definitely be thought about. It's like a mm -hmm. second order target, but also has a potential huge impact. So that's something I would think about. Yeah. So that kind of leads me to a question that I'm going to read verbatim, um, uh, which is that what plans do you have to help UK farmers? I mean, I think internationally, Eri, for your uh, benefit, uh, farmers to think more about data management and analytics as this seems, and is this vital to the economy of the industry? I guess. So basically, uh, I, I think it also relates to a question that's there about skills and training that uh, um, what kind of skills are coming out that are important for this industry and how vital is that for our economies? So I can maybe comment certainly for personal stuff we're doing. So we're working with local colleges to try and evolve their curriculum for mm -hmm. development. Um, I mean, it's a small area, yeah. but you have to start early. I mean, I think in most colleges, um, regardless of the university degree systems, they're kind of, they're the ones that we don't have a huge number in the UK, there's multiple across Europe. I think they kind of are diminishing a bit and they tend to be um, generational family people going to them. It's the colleges areas, arguably the doers, in industry are diminishing in terms of training. It's 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 the industry is not attracting them into these courses. And but what we found and I find when engaging with these kids is actually when you start describing that farming can be run on these things. Now, if I'm talking to 18 year olds now, that's been long enough that it's been embedded in their hand coming out the womb almost. And so they've been trained on iPads, mobiles. The life is embedded on that. So actually translating the employment around those systems becomes a natural progression. And actually the systems, as Adam was talking about, and definitely I know for a fact, Harry's systems as well, um, everything's PC based, it's microprocessor based, it's all going back to kind of dashboards, it's all going back to uh, software and programs. It's things that are, are playing to the audience, the new audience, if you want. Um, so that skill base is kind of is evolving, but it's not evolving fast enough. Um, if you look at traditional agriculture, and I don't think this is uncommon in the UK, the average age is creeping to sixty. Um, that's do you, I wouldn't invest in any industry that had a demographic demographic like that. But these people are driven, um, and I think any investor that looked at something whose demographic of employees was way up at that end would think that's going to collapse. And actually, we do need to change that. So, I mean, I wouldn't consider controlled environment and vertical farming as opposed to it. They've probably got a much younger demographic, certainly what I've seen. Um, but we need to bring the whole demographic down. But because if we want to consider controlled environment and vertical farming as part of the wider crop utility systems, because it could be food, it could be pharma, it could be the production of new specific ingredients, it could be the next cancer drug is produced in vertical farms through gene edited and GM crops. So, and I'm quite wide open on how that's used. Um, I kind of talk myself into a circle here. Um, so this massive changes have to occur. And I think uh, you, you really need to get, there's a whole educational piece. So we, we do odds and sods with schools because we, it's, it's agriculture in it, or horticulture is never looked on as a, as a career option that's looked on as good in schools. Certainly not in the UK. I don't think it is in Europe. 
it's not looked on as an ideal one in America either. It's almost like, well, you can't do all these things, just go into food. You just go into agriculture or food and, food and drink production, um, which is kind of weird given that you, you're, what was it, three meals away from riot or chaos, I think is the, the maxim they tend to use. So it'd be interesting to get others' comments because you're on different demographics from me as well. Yeah. Yeah, Eri, it would be interesting to hear your perspective on this. Right. So um, as an organization, we've been uh, working a lot to provide the training courses. Uh, so, so far, it's like 4,000 alumni in the past um, 10 years for the training course. But the reality is that in this sector, the now it's, we're getting more attention from the data scientists and uh, those kind of uh, exp experts coming into this sector. But then the reality is that it's been just a plant scientist or plant engineering experts. But now I think I think it's going to be changing. And um, and then also from my personal experience that working with uh, younger data scientists, that those kind of people wanted to do something that they want to develop, like a cool AI model things. Mm -hmm. So even though sometimes we don't need to use that much. So I think like a trans, you know, conversation, like a, speaking the same language between these different expertise is a, a starting point. So I think that's a starting point even before, from, from the, even from the questions, I think. <laughs> yeah. So if I translate that, Adam, if you were to hire or recruit a person and you had to choose between somebody who was an agronomist versus a data scientist, who would you choose? <laughs> um, that would actually be a tough decision, except currently I already have an agronomist, so I'd currently pick the data scientist. But <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you, I mean, I you really need both, I think the um, a lot can be done with. I think there's a huge amount of data out there, but I think if you don't have an agronomist who understands, like I think yeah. I think you really need both. If you don't have an agronomist who has like a real grounding and understanding of, particularly from the grower's point of view, what they're looking for, what they're expecting, um, they're kind of like. If you don't have that, then the data scientists won't know what to aim for, what to optimize for, and what to account for. Other uh, like you can pull out lots of good data and good patterns, but you need to have that kind of grounding of like what the industry looks like and, you know, where you can go, where you can make impacts and all these yeah. things. So, um, yeah, I think so, that's definitely. To me, it seems like we are talking about three sets of skills here. We are talking about somebody who understands uh, uh, food, plants, nutrition. So agronomist, we need we are talking of somebody who understands AI and data science and how it can be deployed. And third, we are talking about somebody who understands controls uh, and uh, energy. So are we implying that we need to bring together a community because we cannot water down expertise, right? So we have you know, these, these three disciplines. So either we talk about collaboration or we talk about building a community of a, per, a skilled person who has expertise in all these three areas. What do you think is more doable? People are always going to be more comfortable in their base, their base learning, I think. So, um, I mean, what I've probably seen is I've seen computing graduates and leading people increasingly becoming biology friendly, I suppose is the best way to describe it, mm -hmm. or biologists and growers increasingly stretching their computing capabilities, or the biologists and growers becoming engineers. Um, so you're you're not watering down your base one, you're just adding extra skills, but it's often adding those skills necessary to make what you're doing work than exploring the potential. The, exploring the potential needs often needs a good basic understanding. So I think from that approach, you actually need the different sectoral approaches to come together. Um, as Adam's identified, he said he's got the agronomist. So it's it's getting key individuals with core skills working together as a team, because mm -hmm. that's that's the only way you'll identify trade-offs. 
um, and stops you from doing what happens if I press this button type of approach and then everything explodes or your nutrition or your nutrient solution is invented down the drain. Because I've seen these things happen because the engineer's not there to say, Jesus, don't do that. <laughs> Um, yeah. So you need you need a base level of core skills, but then what that goes up to is actually if you get these associations working together, um, you start to get um, discipline hopper approaches. Mm -hmm. You get interdisciplinarity working together. And I think um, following one of the questions, I think it came from Joanna Price there. You kind of need a sociology approach to the top because you need to you need to socialize the technology. Now, I'm not saying I mean socialising it to the public. It could be socialising it to a different part of the farming industry. Yeah. So how you approach it, you can invent the greatest widget or tool in the world, but that doesn't guarantee it's going to be successful. How you then demonstrate it to the potential customers and off-takers, that will determine often how successful it will be. So there's many other skills you need in this. Mm -hmm. so, 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 sociology might be classed as marketing in this term. So it's how you, how you integrate with your audience personal skills um, and having these teams working together can be challenging at times, shall we say, mm -hmm. um, because they've got di different languages. Yes. Um, and so I, I don't think you'll get one person that will have it all. Yeah. That has been my finding. You need to bring these teams together and get them to work together. Yes. And Adam and Eri will obviously chip in, but uh, in my experience, I've seen that it's actually quite nice to see uh, different skills coming together and uh, because the application is so um, sort of uh, vivid uh, in some manner that I find it I found that it's easier for people to come together from different skills in this area than in many other areas that can be a bit more abstract but uh, I don't know what your experience has been Eri in Japan uh, well, oh, yeah. Yeah, because Go I ahead. know that Chiba has a long standard history of working in this area. So I don't know what kind of skills and backgrounds are being trained. Well, I think, I personally think that the education program for the manager that who can manage and understand the different language to put it together as a team, as Derek said, is more important because as the application is going, uh, more there's more varieties as an application. It could be fresh produce, it could be medicine, pharmaceuticals, and even other things. That so that uh, we we need to understand the design and even social design and other aspects like plant engineering, uh, AI, and then also it, when it comes with the AI experts, I think we need to help better manage as well. So I think that university could. I'll start the new program like educating the good manager who can understand the different languages but put together but I think it's most important thing is to the manager have to understand the philosophy and it was an objective and a goal for the designing so that as long as the manager has that I think that we are on the good track <laughs> but I think the manager play a crucial role I think but I mean the one manager doesn't have to understand everything but you have to you have to understand understand the goal, having the good goal, and also understand having the communication skills mm -hmm. and then management skills. I think it's more important. Yeah. And Adam, from your perspective, what would you like us to do across universities and research centers? Um. Yeah, I think. I think like just maybe doing more hybrid. Courses. So when I was at university, I studied robotics, um, where I kind of studied electrical engineering, a bit of mechanical engineering, computer science, artificial intelligence, and something else. And like each one of those by itself could have been a whole degree. And I think the real strength of my course came from the fact that I did like a real kind of mixture of four other degrees. So I could imagine some kind of, I'd like to see more courses and programs in university like that, where you're doing both like, you know, like I said, like, like, agronomy or growing or biology and also data science and analytics and or something like that where you can have this kind of broad spectrum and take like a bit of rather than just hyper focusing on one thing taking a bit that's from several different courses and doing it in that respect I think so yeah I, I think something like that could be really good and really beneficial so we're, that kind, of, be, we're kind of exploring the concept as well for I mean, maybe the more tertiary ones on PhDs is 
um, having the option of getting a, allowing a PhD to develop their doctorate into more a business plan as well. Um, and so uh, it gives them the option, well, at the end, you might not actually publish it, you'll, but you'll develop the science through to a point that you then want to create a spin out at the end. I kind of like that idea because it offers up a very different route to impact. I mean, it takes a, you have to be wired that way. Um, and some people, I usually find that that is definitely binary. It's a business mind and an academic one. So how do you want to pursue at the end? But having the option or tutoring or, or access to entrepreneurship as part of PhD training or even degree training, as, as Adam said, um, that offers a different career path completely at the end. I think, and it's just exposure to that, I think, is key, particularly at the degree level. If you start suddenly opens up because a lot of people um, often, depending on what they're doing with their degrees, maybe don't really un know where they want to go at the end. So mm -hmm. I think being exposed to that, usually quite early on, I think, if they can do it. Um, but I think we're starting to see an evolution into that. Although I would say the UK, and again, this might just be the UK system, it goes from high thing fundamental degrees to um, must be applicable and create economic impact, and then it'll swing back again after another 20 years. Mm -hmm. so. um, I'm going to, again, bring it back towards decarbonization. How important do you think it's for the, for the future of controlled environment agriculture to work towards decarbonization? Do you think that's kind of make it or break it as a business? And you repeat that, I kind of broke up for me there. Uh, decarbonization, how important it is for a business? Uh, certainly for an early one. I think, again, going back to what I was saying on the investment piece, if you don't have an ESG, you won't get the investment back. So they're, they're unfortunately bearing the brunt of that. Um, I think if we go forward, I think you'll see regulations on reporting your emissions are coming in. And particularly, well, it depends on what you're doing. If you're reducing a technology, that might be, slightly lesser but if you're a grower and supplying a retailer the retailer is having to report their scope three emissions so you're going to have to record what yours are and feed into theirs so sustainability through just absolute requirement is coming in um, and actually the i would say the, the knockback or the coincidental benefit of that is it will identify bottlenecks or opportunities within your system that you could exploit and or improve Adam? Yeah. Um, I think that, I mean, I think it's, I don't know if it's strictly a requ like required from a business point of view, but I think it's certainly required from like just a base point of like society. We like, it's just in order for things to go forward and function, I think we need to aim for zero carbon. And I think one of the, off, you know, this is often kind of viewed in business world as kind of like, sometimes it's too often viewed as like a nice to have or a like zero carbon comes at a cost to the business. And I think, I think it's certainly in some ways it's true, but I think that like, I'm very much of like the have your cake and eat it too. I think it's really possible to have both where you can aim for a kind of lower carbon effective company. It's often creates, requires some more creative thinking, I think to get there. But I think there's no reason that any company shouldn't be able to do both and like, make it work and often can lead to, in my opinion, more creative and more like effective solutions for both the company financially and also for the um, mm -hmm. like for zero carbon impacts and things like that as well. So I think that you have to get a bit creative, but I think that actually you can do both very effectively and often it can be an addition rather than a, um, like a help rather than a hindrance. And Eri, from your perspective? Yes, I think there's no uh, option that is just math things to do that we need to achieve. Because otherwise, because, you know, this sector, especially plant factory particle farm, is still small, as I mentioned before. So once they get in, develop and get in bigger industry, like it would definitely we need to prove that the sustainability, the real sustainability. So I mm -hmm. think the life cycle assessment, FDA data is needed more. And because even sometimes the company claim that, you know, can reduce like a 90% water usage, but like, how did you calculate? Or like, how are you using the water recycling? And then, I mean, so I think there are many things that we need to um, 
consider. And then it's also even the construction part. And then material based, we need to rethink that what material need to be used for the building, even the building. So I think that we there's no option other than doing achieving and then trying but it's it's also collaborating even internationally is crucial yeah i believe yeah. yeah yeah that's a very good note on which to wrap this up that uh, it's a small community and we do need to collaborate and work with each other um any final thoughts from uh, the three of you before we uh, end off with respect to Okay, maybe if there was one thing you would really like the AI research community to work on, what would that be? Work with me. Give me a shout. Contact me. <laughs> I'm happy to work with you. But we've got large yeah. tools, technologies, and facilities that are creating huge amounts of data, so we're more than happy to be a feedstock for AI development. Um, That's good to hear. Work with the people that have got the big data sets. That's mm -hmm. the key. Mm -hmm. And then can I can I answer just a quick question from the David? I think they just asking about the low cost yeah. engineering in agri tech using yeah. the plastic three D printing. I think that's a definitely important things that you know we it's like a challenging what we could do more with the list small scale and a small size camera or even like a cheap things that what keep we could it, it limited the budget so i think that's a good approach and a good uh i think this, so definitely we need to we need to look for that mm -hmm. yeah um yeah like uh same with Derek. um definitely if anyone's interested do have a linkedin and get in contact because i think we will be hiring um data scientists probably later in the year or early next year um but yeah, I think one of the main things for me is like this, because the control, like, because the landscape's so varied, some kind of interoperability and like multi, like multimodal kind of models that are capable of doing more than one thing or adapting in a far more easy way and trying to do something today like that is certainly something that I would find useful and interesting. So yeah, multimodality and interoperability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we are kind of over time now. So, uh... So thanks, thank you so much, uh, Derek, Ari, and Adam for uh, uh, being our, our panelists today. Uh, we will be creating a summary document of today's webinar and we will post it out. And for the audience, if you would like to hear more about upcoming uh, webinars, there's a link on the chat. Um, and somebody is asking if we can have access to the recording of this, I will let, uh, the events team answer to that. But in the meantime, thanks so much. This was great. And I look forward to uh, future discussions with each one of you. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very bye. much. Bye. bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>